Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Factorally. Factorally. We're here to bring you more interesting, hopefully interesting, yeah, facts. So we, we thought we could go away and only, only do a few, but actually we have to do a lot more. <laughs> Every time we start picking a subject, uh, it just takes us on this amazing deep delve. Um, we, we sort of pick out a subject which at first we think, oh, we could probably chat about that for 20 minutes. And then a week later, my goodness me, we've we've yes. spent, well, Bruce, you told me earlier on, you, you reckon we could do an entire episode just about a nail. Well, not a nail, but the nail. Yes, absolutely. The nail as a whole. The yes. nail as a thing. <laughs> absolutely. So what are we talking about this week, Bruce? Well, I think we're talking about tools. Yes, I agree. But do you agree that what what is a tool? If, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> yes, we need some um, differentiation here, don't we? Is it is. something that that you use to change the environment around you that isn't you or something? Is, is that one of the definitions? Right, yes. So valid point. Let's start off with a definition. Uh, what is a tools. tool? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, a tool is a device or implement, especially one held in the hand, used to carry out a particular function and change the environment around you. Ah, so th I must have read that somewhere then. You must have done. That's actually in there. Um, which, uh, it, it's it's vague, isn't it? You know, you sort of, when, when we first said, let's do a thing about tools, I instantly thought, oh, that's nice and easy. Black and Decker, hammers and saws, that's what a tool is. But based on that definition, it is any implement that you can use for any purpose ever. I mean, the first tool, I guess, is a hammer, isn't it? I mean, the first thing that people did was hit stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so tools go back. I mean, they're they're old, aren't they? You know, they as as long as well, animals have been using tools. It's not just humans, is it? Mm. I mean, animals. There's there's birds that that pick up a rock or use a rock to open i think they're is it oyster catchers they use i was going to say a it's, it's, it's a, a snail or a mollusk or something is it yes. they they whack against a, a rock. rock to 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 open the shell yeah so technically that's using a tool yeah so yes so they've been used since forever um in human terms the the oldest evidence of of a tool that i've found is um 3.3 million years old so reasonably old uh, in Kenya, um, a few years ago, they they found some some pieces of rock that were most distinctly hewn and napped to make a, a cutting edge. Uh, what, is, um, what is a nap? A nap is where you. Oh, I was going to use a, te a, a technical word to describe a technical word. There, that doesn't help. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what's the difference between a, 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 a rock and a rock that's napped? So, a napped rock has had bits chiselled and chipped away from it in a slightly pointy, chamfered manner to make a sharp cutting edge, rather than being blunt. As as um, opposed to a bit that's just sort of chipped off or or like yeah. a bit of slate or something. Yeah. So it's been dis it's been deliberately hewn into a particular shape for a particular purpose, as opposed to oh look, I've just picked up a sharp rock it's actually been deliberately carved Good. and you can see it you can see these little hand-sized lumps of rock that are distinctly pointy and and each edge is you know symmetrical so it's it's you know too much of a coincidence to just be a natural rock um but they also found some larger pieces of rock they found a, a lump of rock uh, that was about 15 kilograms on this particular site the the, the site is called lomekwe 3 in kenya um, and they found this 15 kilo lump of rock, which they guess might have been used as a as an anvil of sorts to sort of hammer one piece of rock against the other on this anvil to make smaller tools. So they've been around for a while. And what would those tools have been used for? They would have been sort of largely for, for cutting and um, preparing anything from sort of making clothing to preparing food to, I don't know, cutting cutting the the prehistoric lawn <laughs> um i think i've seen that episode of the flintstones yes yes absolutely yeah <laughs> who doesn't want a dinosaur as a lawnmower <laughs> yeah i seem to i seem to remember that the earliest evidence of man using a tool was that they found the bones of, a, of an antelope um that had scores on the on the bones which proved that some that, that somebody had actually chopped the meat oh off the bone with oh, a I tool see. So not that the bone was being used as a tool, but it had cuts in it 
which meant it had been I had Butchered. the tool used on it. Butchered, yes. yeah. Oh, wow, fantastic. Well, not so fantastic for the antelope. No. but, but then, Fantastic you know, for the historians. Yes, but then <laughs> the antelope was probably killed by a whole load of people chucking rocks at it anyway, or spears True. or something. True, yeah. So um, we, we always like to do a, a bit of etymology. We've done the definition of tool. The etymology of tool, where the word comes from, is, um, is really disappointing, actually. Um, <laughs> the word tool comes from the Old English word tool, meaning an implement that you use to do stuff with. Oh, wow, that's, that, that's incredible. Isn't that amazing? So tool literally means tool, which comes from the word that sounds a lot like tool, which literally means tool. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So, so, so okay. So, so the first ones were were hammers and um, and cutting implements. Mm. I have a theory that the most useful tool ever invented was the needle, and still is the needle to some degree. Because if you think about it, without a needle, you can't make clothes mm. uh, because you need to sew clothes together. But also, you can't make spacesuits. Without needles, <laughs> so yes, there's a direct correlation. So there. there is a direct correlation between the needle that was used to sew animals together to make rudimentary clothing, mm. and man walking in space. Wow. Okay, fair enough. I I still I still reckon the the most important simple element of a tool is is the blade of some form or other. You know. Even even going back to that that pointy sharp rock to cut stuff with, you know that leads to saws. It leads to weapons of all kinds: spears and arrows and and knives and, swords. and all sorts swords. Yeah, everything. Um, but the needle. Okay, I wonder what the modern world would look like without a needle. Well, exactly. I mean, I can see what it would look like without swords because you just hit people over the head with hammers or poke each other with needles. Or exactly. <laughs> Sharp things, <laughs> pointy things, rather than than bladed things. Interesting. Oh, I wonder what the difference is between a pointy thing and a bladed thing. Uh, is a needle a form of blade? Ah, no, it isn't, because the blade has to have an edge on a side. Ah, yes, Cause, it because does. A, um, technically, a foil, uh, the, the 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 fencing um, sword, yes, is not a blade because it only has a point. Whereas oh. an epee and a saber are mm -hmm. bladed weapons because they actually have a, a a sharpened edge. Gotcha. What's an epee? Okay, an epee is like a cross between um, a foil and and a and and a saber. It's um, if you look at it, it looks a little bit like a saber, mm. but it's much thinner. Oh, is it? Um, is it sort of the sort of swords that musketeers would use? Sort of yes. quite skinny. Yes. Um, Often they have like, they're triangular, type. so they have three blades on them. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the difference in 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 the sport is that a foil you only get a point if you actually point if you hit somebody with the pointy end, hmm. whereas a, a saber you only get a, a point if you hit somebody with the slicey with the slicey bit. Right. Um, on the torso. Okay. Whereas epe, you get a point if you hit anybody anywhere with any part of the of the uh, oh, sword. Okay. So you can hit them on the head, the foot. That all counts in in epe. Right. Have you done this yourself? Uh, yes, I used to teach fencing. <laughs> did you? Yes. Of course you did. <laughs> um, if our dear listeners haven't twigged this yet, Bruce has essentially done every single job. And met every single interesting person uh, in the world ever. Uh, and every time we have a chat, these things just sort of come up. Oh yes, I once taught fencing. Oh yes, I used to know Alan Bennett. Whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's fun. No, no, it's good. It's fun. It brings a, a little bit of class to this otherwise <laughs> mundane um, chat. Well, I have. Nonsense. I have used a tool. Have you? I have. I have Recently. been known to use a tool. In okay. fact, I, ha I, ha I have the envy of many a man. 
as well as owning, <laughs> as well as owning one of those bright red snap-on t- uh, tool cabinets. Yes, I've tools. seen that. Yes, I, I can. It's a it's a pity that the the viewers, the viewers, the listeners <laughs> can't be viewers because yeah, your your red snap-on chest is is quite a feature on this little uh, Zoom meeting we have here. Yes. Tell us what's in your red people, snap-on chest. People love my snap-on. It's yeah. um, oh well, it's generally stuff for tinkering with cars. But okay. there are also many, many, many uh, wide and varied tools mm. in it, uh, mm. ranging from three different sets of spanners for sort of like metric imperial and, and mm-hmm. Whit- Whitworth. There's also Japanese metric, I think, as well, different to metric, metric. Metric, metric. Yeah. Um, so I do, but I don't have that set. Fine. Um, okay. Well, yes, and, and a whole set day. of Allen key, you know, proper Allen keys with oh, okay. handles on. And, yes. And various multi multifarious screwdrivers and, <laughs> and of course hammers. And and, and yes. which gets us back very nicely. Oh um, a great to, segue. To where we were. So um this interested me. I, I was wondering what the most um prolific, the most popular, the most frequently purchased tool of the modern era is uh, and i was sort of looking around various different reports on uh, the the world market of hand tools which is an an absolute uh rabbit hole don't even look at it because you will spend hours down there um what would you suggest is the most popular the most often purchased the biggest grossing tool is it the screwdriver it's not I thought it was going to be the screwdriver as well. I thought of all the tools that everybody owns, the screwdriver is up there. It's really not. It's about the fifth most popular hand tool, or at least the fifth most grossing in terms of sales hand tool. Is it a Stanley knife? Nope. Blades, mm. see? It's, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And they, yeah. Stanley invented the utility blade, the Stanley knife. Did he? Yes. Ah, so he also invented the a... um, the power lock uh, the power lock tape measure. Oh, brilliant! So before that, you'd sort of like pull pull out the tape measure and then just go straight back in, or yeah. you'd use a like one of those uh, bits of wood with lots of joints in it to measure up. Yes, and I know and stuff. Yes, yes. So yeah, the power the power lock tape measure was wow. a Stanley. Invention. I love that that can be attributed to in one fact, particular was the tape person. Me- is the tape measure one of the things that people, I suppose people keep them from? No, that was nowhere. That was nowhere on the list at all. I'll put you out of your misery. It is actually, as we've already spoken about, hammers. Aha. Uh-huh. So the global hammer market um, is currently worth about $3.5 billion. Wow. And it's is that all lot. hammers? So that's everything from tack hammers and claw hammers yes, and exactly. mallets so it's and not, sorts. it's not just the sort of quintessential claw hammer that we we all have at home it's it's anything from hammers to mallets to um whatever you can hit a thing with and call it a hammer <laughs> um the second is spades and shovels 1.8 it does but, yeah but then again i mean not everybody has a garden no um that must just show how many gardeners there are out there who garden on behalf of other people, no, that doesn't even make well, sense. Well, or, or, or who garden so hard that they, that they break go stuff. through a lot of yes, yes, it could be that. And I suppose once you take into consideration the the building trade and oh yes, I like suppose that, so. I was just thinking it's not like just it's not just extreme gardening in, in my yes. <laughs> vein is extreme ironing and stuff. So the global spade and shovel market is worth one point eight billion dollars, and then it suddenly drops down to hand saws at seven hundred million dollars um but yeah so hammers hammers are right up there at the top who'd have thought wow well Hmm. i suppose there are you know many many different hammers there are i suppose i must own five different hang on got two claw hammers tack hammer mallet nylon hammer two claw hammers one rubber (laughs) mallet um and and a very strange multi tool that has a hammer in it. So yeah, so I've got five hammers and a very strange multi tool. <laughs> now multi tool. I'm glad you said multi tool. I, I did a bit of poking around multi tools. Um, I've I've got a few multi tools. Like a Leatherman or something like that. I, I've got a 
I don't even know what the brand is actually. It's probably just generic. But little things fold out of it, and it's got a screwdrivery bit. Up oh, like a Swiss Army knife, but sort of like a tools. Swiss Army knife. Um, so that led me into looking at Swiss Army knives, which is a whole topic in itself. And I discovered that um, there were actually Roman army knives. That the Swiss Army knife concept wasn't invented by the Swiss, but the Romans. Um, of course. Of course. What did the Romans ever do for us? <laughs> um, in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, there is uh, an, an item on display which it, it, it's instantly recognisable as an army knife, except that it's Roman. Uh, and it's made out of a, a combination of iron and silver. And it's it's exactly what you'd think from an army knife. It has folding compartments. It's bigger than a Swiss army knife. It's several inches long, but um, it has a fold-away knife, fork, spoon, pick, spatula, and spike. And they reckon that the spike was used for... Um, for opening clams and seafood and, and things like that. So it's, a, it's the Roman spork? The Roman spork. Romans invented the spork. There you go. We have it on record. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really, it's instantly recognisable. It really does look like a, a multi-tool, but a bit bigger and a bit more cumbersome. Uh, and, and therefore, we assume this was a standard issue in the Roman army. Wow. Isn't that great? That's brilliant. Mm. I suppose Romans invented a lot of tools for war, but I but you don't really think about the domestic tool. No, I suppose I, I sort of think of the the engineering elements that, you know, whenever the Romans conquered a place and then moved on to another place, they, they built some some jolly fine straight roads. And therefore they must have had shovels and pickaxes Picks, yeah. and, and things like that to, to do that with. Um so I guess that kind of makes sense. Yes, of course. Yes, and then we hit the Dark Ages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Where there were no tools and no, no tools. manufacturing and, and no and all the, all the Roman all, all the Roman good, good stuff the Romans put in was all demolished and, yes. and, and turned into other things. Yes. Well done, Dark Ages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I mentioned before, I mean, hammers, obviously, you use a hammer to... Um, to knock in a, quite a lot of the time, to knock in a nail. And we did talk yes. about how, how many different sorts of nail there were and how, what na uses nails were. In fact, I discovered something which I never, re which is obvious, but I never actually realized that if you know anybody called Nailer, there mm. was actually a profession, which was the person who made nails. Mm. And that person was called a Nailer. A Nailer. That makes sense. Um, and they were originally uh, made by blacksmiths and they used like a heated iron rod and then they chopped it into bits and sharpened it up and made a head for it. Okay. Um, and they were, and, and nails were really, really valuable. Nails were like currency. Hmm. You could actually, you know, buy and sell nails. And, and, and the Romans, I think, made huge quantities of nails. When they left, um, there was a, they left, Scotland in mm. about 86 AD. Mm. Um, and um, they left behind seven tons of nails. Good grief. When they left. In this the items it. that they nailed or just loose? <laughs> loose. Huh. Loose nails. When they evacuated the fortress of Inch Tutil in Perthshire. Right. Uh, seven tons. Crikey. All, yeah. That's a lot of nails, isn't it? That is really a lot of nails. <laughs> I know. I know. And, and, and um, I think that, that one of the reasons we call pennies pennies is because mm. um, a penny was the price of 100 nails. Oh, really? Yes. They were, they were so rare. I think in America, they were so rare when the colonists arrived mm. that people used to take them with when they moved house. Oh, and, really? And if they couldn't get them out of the house when they moved house, they would burn the house down. <laughs> and then go through the ashes and looking for nails. nails so they could take them onto the next place. And they actually had to bring in laws to stop people from this practice of burning their house down to get the nails out. That's brilliant. But in, in carpentry terms, um, 
houses you know, or, or structures or whatever they were used to be put together by just joining the bits of wood, which is why you get joiners and, and joinery. Um, so you'd sort of have dovetail shaped bits of wood that fit into each other and, and, and just fit so snugly and so securely that they wouldn't have needed nails. And I'm just picturing the, you know, the, a, a certain era of architects going, we don't need these newfangled nails. What mod modern rubbish. Well, there are people who still build stuff. And there, there are carpenters and joiners who pride themselves on the fact that they make stuff with no nails yeah. in it whatsoever. Which reminds me that there is actually a, a huge building in London which has been built with absolutely no nails in it whatsoever. None at all. No nails. None at all. And, and it's vast. It's, it's, the, it's a Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. And it's near Ikea in Brent Cross. Ah. And it, as, you, as you go th down a road, you kind of see this thing in front of you that looks like the Taj Mahal. Yeah. It is amazing. And it's built of like thousands of tons of marble, this wow. thing, and, and, and wood. And there are no nails in it at all anywhere. Gosh. God, that's an engineering feat, isn't it? They I know. Weren't, they it's, didn't it, just it, use it, that spray on sticky stuff, no nails, did they? <laughs> <laughs> They, I think they used very old technology to make sure that everything fitted absolutely perfectly, yeah. which is ironic given that it's around the corner from Ikea. Oh, that's great. What a piece of irony. <laughs> Imagine the, uh, the, the instruction manuals that came to put the temple together. I vaguely remember that they, they, they bought the, the limestone and marble and stuff mm. in Europe, mm. shipped it to India to have it cut, and then shipped it back to the UK to assemble it. Mm. In, into this huge, great temple. Wow. It's quite Cracking. something. Uh, definitely. If, if, if you ever come to London, go and, uh, A, go and visit Ikea because you... you know, it's an experience. Balls. But <laughs> but also, as you're at Ikea, just walk up the road and you will see the most amazing sight that you would never expect to see in the middle mm. of London. Brilliant. There we go. You, you're not only getting interesting facts, you're getting tourism guide tips as well. <laughs> tools, uh, to my mind, bring up images of DIY. Uh, how are you at DIY, Bruce? You've obviously, you've got a snap-on chest full of tools. Are you good at using them around the house? I, I have been known to assemble stuff and put up shelves and actually uh, build um, stuff from scratch. Really? So yes, I can. Excellent. I'm average at DIY. There are some things I can do quite easily. There are simple things that I really struggle with. Um, but by default, I'm the only one in the household who stands even a chance of being able to do it. Therefore, it is my role. You are the nominated DIYer. Indeed, yes. So now I remember my dad using Black & Decker tools, left, right, and center. It was like they were the only, the only brand that he only was... Only power tools. The only brand of power tools that he was in. Keep your Bosch and your whatever else. But um, that was what he went with. And... Um, I didn't realize Black & Decker were an American company. I yes, in fact, they own they Stanley English. as well now. Do they? Yes. Uh, Black & Decker were the ones who invented and patented the handheld electric drill, specifically with a pistol grip and trigger switch. Wow. Which is e exactly what I think of when I think of an electric drill. Yes. Um, and this was relatively early on. This is, this was, they, they patented this thing back in, back in the 1930s. Wow how that actually looked and worked back then i'm not entirely sure but um it, yeah a handheld to, drill to a handheld drill specifically with the and and now knowing that they're an american company i thought they were english describing it as having a pistol grip and a trigger switch it sort of yeah fits, it kind of like this it? this this is the this is what you're used to uh fellow americans so yes. let's <laughs> let's make it let's make it this shape <laughs> but the the the, the workmate was was something that was actually was so revolutionary as as a way mm. of actually holding stuff while you were while you were sawing it or screwing it or whatever you were doing on it. Mm. And they when they first came out, I I remember being very very impressed with with what it was. These days they mm. they feel an old one feels slightly flimsy, but. Right. Um, as an aside, when I bought my first property, I didn't have any furniture, and I actually had a Black & Decker workmate as my dining table. Oh. <laughs> Whilst other people were using their dining table as their Black & Decker workmate. <laughs> or building their, <laughs> building their dining table using their Black & Decker workmate, which yes. is what I should have been doing. <laughs> 
the last thing I just wanted to have a look at, um, we've we've started a bit of a trend at looking at records around various things, the biggest, the fastest, the smallest, oh, yes. whatever. Yeah, so what records have you um, found for us? So I found, uh, so again, these are going to be slightly controversial because they have a, a slightly loose interpretation of what is a tool. But if you'll sort of bear with, the largest tool is a hydraulic cylinder uh, created for a Japanese dredging barge in 2015. This hydraulic cylinder extends up to 66 feet in length and weighs 200 metric tons. So whether we want to call that a tool or a piece of machinery or whatever is is sort of up up for debate, but that's pretty big. Um, I then looked at the complete opposite, the the world's smallest power tools. Uh, Now there's a, a YouTuber from Spain called Enos Camere, and he's got a, a thing about making things in miniature. He sort of creates um, you know, doll houses and, and miniature items. And he created uh, a power drill and a circular saw at one twelfth scale. Wow. And that and they work. I wouldn't where necessarily would you, where trust Where would you the find saw. a brushless motor for, for something that small? It's incredible. Have a look it up on, on YouTube. And and he's made this little he's made a replica Makita power drill. Which looks exactly like the real thing, but it's it's about one inch. Uh, so they've got the biggest and the smallest. Well, there you go. Biggest and smallest. Yeah, exactly. And then one last little record. Uh, again, I, I sort of went. Um, I started looking at drills. Don't know why drills fascinate me, um, <laughs> but um, I started looking at, at drills. And in in Russia, near the Russian Norway border, built all the way back in the nineteen seventies. They started drilling a hole in the ground for geophysical research purposes, not to get oil or water or anything, but just for, for research purposes. Um, and this drill, they managed to to drill a hole into the earth, which reached a record depth of 12,262 meters. Meters? Meters. Wow. I can't even picture what that looks like, but the, the bottom of this hole is the deepest artificial point on Earth. Blimey. So there you go. That's, a, that's fantastic. That's a really long hole, isn't that, it? How many miles <laughs> is that? That's roughly seven and a half miles. Sorry, this thing is seven and a half miles deep. That The, the hole that has been drilled by this thing is seven and a half miles so deep. So that means that, some, that to get down that far, they have to have dropped the drill down yes. seven and a half miles. Yeah, so I think it's one of these devices where you sort of drill to a certain depth and then you put an extension on the top of the drill yes. and drill a bit more. So there's, a, there's a pole on. seven and a half miles long that's going round. Mm. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. yeah. It's truth. It's, um, it's a big drill, isn't it? <laughs> that, is, that is crazy. Yeah. Well, thank, yeah. thank you, Simon. That is, that is brilliant. That is, that is an excellent. Well, that's worth listening to the that, podcast for. Brought that there just for you. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> After a fact like that, there's nothing else to do but end the podcast, I think. <laughs> yes, I think that's a, that's a, a podcast ending fact. Yes. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a mic drop. That is absolutely. Yes. And as voiceovers, we, we never do that because we're too, no, too respectful of the too equipment. Much. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. I think we're up to at least three listeners now. So thank you to all three of you for listening to us uh, droning on about tools. Yes. And if you have tools, um, go and use them. Yes. It's good for your mental health. It is excellent for your mental health. Unless they stress you out, in which case, get some. Or unless you cut your finger off, which is is bad for you. Yeah. So if you you enjoy this sort of uh, chit chat, then please join us again next week where we will find another equally mundane topic to find some fascinating facts from and don't forget to do all that usual podcasty stuff of liking subscribing sharing and commenting if you like why not yeah drop some comments tell us what your personal experiences are with with tools either positive or negative exactly (laughs) and uh we will see you all next time cheerio bye-bye